The Buddha once said that if we could get what we wanted simply through wishing and prayer, there would be no one in the world who was poor, no one in the world who was ugly. No one in the world who was sick or had a short life. So what are we doing when we express a wish, say, for the happiness of all beings? May I be happy. May all beings be happy. May we all be released from suffering. May we all not be deprived of the good fortune we have attained. It's not that we hope that the wish will make these things happen, but we are trying to make sure that our intentions fall in line with our own highest aspirations. For you look at the mind as it goes through the day, you have lots of different intentions. Some of them are skillful, some of them are not. And they tend to pull in opposite directions. If someone were to appear in front of you right now and say, okay, you have three wishes, what would you say? What would you wish for? Do you have skillful intentions already well formulated? It's a huge help to the practice. If you can stop and think about what is your highest aspiration, what is your most sincere aspiration? For otherwise you find yourself acting on all kinds of unskillful aspirations and they don't have anything to stop them. There was a student movie that was made a couple years before I went to Orberlin, and it still plays as far as I know. It's about a student who steps on a little plaque, the, the sidewalks in Tappan Square, met at one point, and there's a plaque dedicated to the person who's Fortune had been used to fix up Tappan Square. And as far as I know, people would not step on the plaque. But in the movie one day someone steps at the plaque and this genie suddenly appears in a puff of smoke in front of him and says, You have three wishes. What would you like? And the kid, being kind of a Joe Schmo, ends up wishing for revenge on his friends for all the indignities he's suffered at their hands. That's probably what most people would wish for. A lot of people go through life with a lot of resentments, and all they can think about is how much they would like to see so-and-so get his or her just desserts. But if you're really sincere in trying to find true happiness, you can't let those kinds of intentions, those kinds of aspirations have control in your mind, not even for a little bit of time. Which is why we have these chants every day, to get the idea embedded in your mind that what you really want is happiness for all beings. And if you're going to try to find a happiness, you want a happiness that doesn't harm anyone else's happiness. You want to keep your intentions all in line, at least the intentions that you act on. And when something comes up in your mind that would work at cross purposes, you'll be able to recognize it. And the advertising industry has realized the power of a repeated message. You hear something over and over and over again, and it seems to be embedded in your nerves. So this is why we chant it every day. May I be happy. May all living beings be happy. We want that to be our underlying intention. So we keep reminding ourselves of that. And then the next step, of course, is to act on that intention. And in simple terms, this is what the practice is all about, trying to find a true happiness that doesn't place burdens or place obstacles in other people's way. There's that passage where King Basenide asks his queen, it was probably a tender moment, 
the two of them are together, alone. And he asks her, is there anyone you love more than yourself? And he's hoping, of course, that she'll say, yes, of course, you. But she doesn't. She says, no. And how about you? Is there anyone you love more than yourself? And he has to admit that, no, there's no one he loves more than himself. So that's the end of the tender scene. The king goes down from the palace to goes to see the Buddha. And the Buddha says, it's true, you survey the world and you find that everyone loves him or herself very fiercely. And so he says, you should never harm anyone else. We can interpret this in two ways. One is that simply the realization we have all this in common. We really love ourselves. We really all want happiness. It's a deep-seated desire. So we recognize that we have this trait in common. But you also recognize that if your happiness depends on someone else's suffering, they're not going to stand for it. If they can, they'll do what they can to overturn that happiness. So if you want happiness that's secure, it has to be based on not harming anyone else. And fortunately, it turns out that true happiness is something that comes from within. The causes for suffering come from within, and the solution comes from within. If you look at dependent core arising, you notice that a good half of the factors all take place prior to sensory contact. We tend to attribute our, our suffering to things happening at the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind, the input that comes in through our senses, the physical and mental pain that we suffer through the senses. But as the Buddha points out, that's not where the true cause of suffering lies. Pain doesn't have to induce suffering. Unpleasant sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations don't have to induce suffering. We suffer because of our ignorance. We suffer because of our intentions. We suffer from what we bring to sensory contact, which means that if we end that ignorance, and regardless what, of what happens at the senses, we don't have to suffer. So this is how goodwill for ourselves, goodwill for other beings, leads us into the mind, leads us to practicing meditation, because we want to put an end to that ignorance that underlies all our suffering. And what it comes down to, as the Buddha says, is inappropriate attention, not seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Now, this doesn't mean just not knowing about the Four Noble Truths. It means not really looking at our experience in terms of those truths, in terms of those categories, and not developing the skills that are based on those categories. The first category, of course, is to see where there's stress where they're suffering. And here the Buddha is not simply talking about the stress of change or the stress of inconstancy. It goes deeper. It's the stress that comes from craving and clinging. We cling to the five aggregates as us or ours. That's why we suffer. So the trick is learn how, learn, to learn how not to cling. In other words, to find out why we crave these things and to put an end to that craving. And that requires finding something that's more solid than these things. So we develop concentration to be able to look at the mind in this way, because the duty with regard to stress is to comprehend it. And it takes 
a lot of mental strength in order to look at the stress and suffering that are coming into the mind. And concentration provides that strength. We bring the mind to a state of oneness, a state of unification, with a sense of ease, well-being, fullness, refreshment. We try to develop this as a skill, something we can tap into whenever we need it. So here we are developing the Fourth Noble Truth, and that's the duty with regard to the Fourth Noble Truth, is that we develop it. In other words, when concentration comes, you don't just know, oh, here comes concentration, whoops, there it goes. When it comes, you try to see how you can keep it in focus. How to stay as still as possible. Without squeezing the, the pleasure out of that stillness. Without squeezing the fullness out of that stillness. This requires time and it takes effort, but it is a skill that we can master, that we can develop. Once we have this skill, then we can turn around and look at that stress and suffering that comes from craving and, craving and clinging. to see what advantages it gives us, and also to see the drawbacks. And if you look at these things carefully, you begin to realize that the drawbacks way outweigh the, the advantages, especially when you're coming from a, a feeling of fullness, well-being, the simple stress that comes from that craving and clinging becomes more and more apparent. And you come to realize that it's not really necessary. We used to think that to be happy, we needed the craving, we needed the clinging. But when you see that you don't need it, why would you continue doing it? You drop it. You let it go. This is where the teachings on inconstancy, stress, and not self come in. You look at the craving, you look at the clinging, you see that these things are inconstant. They come and they go, and when they come, they bring stress with them. And so you ask yourself, okay, if these things are stressful and they don't really lead to any true happiness, why would you want to claim them as you, as yours? And it's in letting go of that sense of identification or a sense of possession. That's how the mind is freed from its clinging. This is why the Buddha taught the teaching on not self. He wasn't concerned with establishing a philosophical principle that there is no self, and then you have to explain everything in terms of there being no self. That wasn't his approach at all. You look at how the Buddha treated those three knowledges in the night of his awakening, the knowledge of past lives, the knowledge of seeing beings arising and passing away. Now most people, when they reached that point, would have said, hey, I've got a great basis here for a great theory about the way the world works, and create a philosophy, create a system out of that. And the canon talks about people who did just that, and ended up in all kinds of wrong views wrong in the sense that they don't really tackle the problem of why people are suffering and how you can put an end to the suffering. That was what was special about the Buddha's approach. He took that knowledge and asked himself, how can this apply to putting an end to suffering? And he realized that it came from seeing that people suffered based on their intentions. Like, where are intentions happening in your mind? They're happening right here. And why do they cause suffering? It's because they're based on ignorance. So when you put an end to that ignorance, when you really comprehend suffering and stress, when you fully abandon their cause, 
fully developed a path, that's when you realize the end of suffering. And all those teachings have done their work. You can put them aside. You don't need them anymore. It's like building a house. As long as you're working on the house, you need to take good care of the tools, keep them in good condition, have them right near at hand. When the house is done, you don't need the tools anymore. It's when the teaching on not-self has done its job, then you can put that aside, too. It's not that you're going to replace it with the teaching that there is a self. You realize that all those theories are just another example of suffering and stress, if you cling to them. Because what you've done is you've taken that intention, may I be truly happy, may all beings be truly happy. And you've applied it to everything you think about, everything you say, everything you do, even as you get into the deep layers of concentration, the deep layers of meditation. That's always the underlying intention. Given that you've had a particular experience with a particular state of concentration, you've gained particular insights, how do you use that concentration, how do you use that insight for the sake of true happiness, a blameless happiness? This is why it's important that we try to establish that intention as firmly as possible and keep acting on it and don't let ourselves get waylaid. So that expression, may I be truly happy, it's not just a, an idle wish or it's not that we think that simply by wishing it it's going to happen. We're trying to keep our intentions in line, be very clear about what we really want so that we can act on it consistently, so that no matter what happens in the meditation, and it is, it happens, you know, people sometimes gain psychic powers, they gain strong insights, and if that intention is not firm, they start going astray. Even with great insights, you can go astray. If you forget the purpose of what we're doing here, why we're here. We're here to find a blameless happiness, a total happiness, a happiness that doesn't require that we keep feeding on other people. So think about this each time you repeat that phrase, may I be happy, may all living beings be happy, because it's what the practice is all about.